So let's take a look at an example. Let's say that I have a function f of xy given by y squared minus x plus 10. And let's say that I have a constraint function given by g of xy equals x squared plus y squared equals 4. So based on the analogy of our previous example, this function is like our mountain function. This is the function that we want to maximize and minimize. And this function is our constraint function, which was like our road. I can tell that it's our constraint function, function because it's set exactly equal to a constant. So I, I have just some level curve that's in the xy plane. Um, that's, that's why I know that it's the constraint function. Really, when we arithmetically, when we work this out with algebra, it's not going to matter which one is labeled as which. But let's go ahead and use our Lagrange multiplier method. I'm going to find the gradient of my f function, and I'm going to set that equal to lambda times the gradient of my g function. And when I set these equal to each other, I'm going to get a whole system of equations, and we're going to do a bunch of algebra, and then we'll come up with a solution. So first, let's recall, what is the gradient of f? The gradient of f is the partial derivative of f with respect to x, and the first component of my vector function, and the partial derivative of f with respect to y in my second component. And so, in this case, I find that the partial with respect to x is going to be the derivative with respect to x, which is just negative 1. And the derivative with respect to y is just going to be 2y. And that's going to be set equal to lambda times the, the gradient of my constraint function, which in this case is going to be the partial with respect to x, which is 2x, and the partial with respect to y, which is 2y. So I need this vector to be equal to some scalar multiple of this vector. This lambda here is just some scalar multiple. Usually we use Greek letters to mean that it's just some constant value. It's lambda after Lagrange. Anyway, so in order for these two vectors to be equal to one another, it means that the x components of the vector have to be equal and the y components of the vector also have to be equal. So setting the x components of the vector equal to one another, we get that negative 1 has to be equal to lambda times 2x. And setting the y components equal to another, we see that 2y has to be equal to lambda times 2y. We have three different variables that are unknown and only two different equations. So at this point, we actually don't have enough information to be able to solve this. To be able to solve this, we need one more piece of information, and I'll write this piece in green to remind us. Not only does the gradient f have to be equal to lambda times the gradient of g, we also have to have the relationship of the constraint function hold. So I also have to have that x squared plus y squared has to equal 4. And at this point, I have a system of three equations and three unknowns, and we can go back to whatever algebra skills you want to be able to solve three equations and three unknowns. There's no tricks or shortcuts. My, my go-to method is to try to solve one variable in terms of the other and then plug it back in. In this case, there are a couple of things that we can do right away. I see that I'm going to divide 2 from each side of this equation, and I come up with the fact that y is equal to lambda times y. So taking a look at this relationship, if y is equal to lambda times y, that gives me two possible outcomes. One. I could divide both sides by y, and I would see that lambda was equal to 1. Dividing both sides by y, I get that lambda is equal to 1. I'm going to write that over here. But cautionary tale, and this is a cautionary tale that comes up a lot when solving these types of equations. I can only divide both sides by y if y is not equal to 0. This equation is also satisfied if y is equal to 0. So, I can divide by y and see that lambda is equal to 1, or I also have the outcome that y could be equal to 0. Right? That's what this information tells me, solving this system of equations. So let's use this information and go back to one of the other equations and see what we get for x. So in this case, if it's the case that lambda is equal to 1, we get the fact that, so I'll, I'll do this in cases. Maybe my algebra looks messy. I don't have a lot of space here. But if I let lambda equal to 1, 
I go back to my first equation and I say that that means that x is going to be equal to negative one half, just solving, right, by subtract. And if lambda is equal to one and x is equal to negative one half, I can plug that negative one half into my constraint function and find out what y is. That means that in this case, negative one half squared plus y squared equals four, which means that this becomes positive one fourth. So this becomes four minus a fourth, which is 15 fourths. And that means that y would be equal to plus or minus square root of 15 fourths. And that's one possible solution. Another possible solution would be when we take the case two, that y is equal to zero. What happens when y equals zero? Well, this is actually an easy case. We can plug y equals zero directly into our constraint function, and we'd see that if y equals zero, then x would be equal to plus or minus two. I can do that in my head by taking the square root of both sides, plus or minus two. So notice that all of this work gives us out four different solutions. And I'm gonna summarize all four of those solutions. So in this solution, we got the fact that x was equal to negative one half, and we got two different y values out. So I'm gonna record these maybe up above here. Can you guys see that? Yeah, I think you guys can see that. So one possible set of solutions is given by x equals negative one half, y equals square root 15, I'm gonna say over two, because that's the square root of four, or x equals negative one half and y equals negative square root 15 over two. And over here, we also get two solutions. These are the solutions when y equals zero. We get x equals positive two and y was equal to zero. And we also get x equals negative two when y was equal to zero. So how are we gonna be able to figure out which one are max and our min values? because we have this long list of, of values, but really what we want to know is when are they maximized and when are they minimized? We're going to do one more step by plugging them into our function to find out when they're maximized and minimized. So let's evaluate each of these potential max and min values one by one. So the first one that I'm going to look at is f of negative one half comma square root 15 over two. I'm plugging that into my f function because I want to know how high on the road I am at this particular point. And I notice that I get y squared, which is 15 fourths, minus negative 1 half plus 10, which is equal to 15 fourths plus 2 fourths plus 40 fourths, which is 57 fourths. Did I do that right? That's 40 plus 2, that's 42, 52. I think that's correct. Okay. So next I'm going to plug in my next value, which in this case is negative 1 half comma negative square root 15 over 2. And look, I'm going to get out the same exact answer because my y was squared, so it doesn't matter that this is positive or negative. I'm going to get out the negative fifth square root 15 over two squared gets me the same thing. So I have a tie for this value. Let's look at our other two values. If I look at f of two zero, I get out um, of this function, zero squared minus two plus 10, which is equal, whoops, minus two plus 10, which is equal to eight. And then, f of negative 2, 0 is equal to 0 plus 2 plus 10, which is equal to 12. So notice which values are the highest. Um, 12 is the same thing as 48 fourths, and 8 is the same thing as 32 fourths. So I did that to be able to compare that with my 57 fourths, and I see that these two points are our max values, and this point down here, two zero, is gonna be our min value. And this value is sort of a dud, and it's not that surprising that we come up with duds. Let's analyze graphically what's going on in this situation to give us 
um, this behavior. So I'll label these up here. These two were our max values, and then at the point two zero, that's where we got our min value. So to analyze this,